that first time that you met? What was going through your head? Well, let's go back a little bit. So I used to work for the LA Times. I was based in Rome. They sent me to interview Federico Fellini's fortune teller in New Delhi. So after I interviewed the, um, the guru, he said, show me your hand. And he said, you're going to marry a man from a strange country. I mean, I wrote it down, strange country. And um, I went to a lot of strange countries for the LA Times, and I kept thinking, where's Romeo? Um, and then I went home to Italy, and Romeo had emigrated from, a, or run away from a strange country to the home of my friend. He had one address in Rome, and it was my friend Richard Harrison and his wife Francesca. So that's how I met him. He had limited English. He had lots of adjectives and, and adverbs and nouns. He only had the present tense. So he would follow me around telling me about the past in Russia in, in the present tense and about his future in America in the present tense. So that's how it started. But what was your initial impression about meeting Romeo? I, 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 he, I didn't actually recognize that he was Romeo. Um, he was the one who like kept following me around, and pretty soon I sort of said, well, um, I think something's going on. But he was the one who started. I don't I have no idea why he decided that I was the one. Kind of cool. <laughs> <laughs> and how did things progress from there? Um, well, he, he had already gone to the U.S. Embassy. They'd already given him political asylum, and they told him, because they gave everyone from the Soviet Union in those days who were famous and important political asylum immediately. And they told him he needed to stay in Rome for two months, which was okay with me. Um, and, um, and then they would send him to the U.S. So um, Richard, Richard Harrison went off with his wife to some place in the Far East to make a movie, and so Oleg and I, they left us in charge of the house. And um, so we'd spent an amazing two months in Rome, um, you know, just exploring everything, and we went to Florence, and we went to all kinds of places. Um, but one day we went to the Spanish Steppes, and someone yelled out, Oleg, Oleg Vidov, what are you doing in Rome? And it was a, uh, an American, you saw him, he was a film critic, um, um, and I think he was the head of the San Francisco Film Festival, who was and he used to go to the, the festivals all the time, and he said, do you know who this is? And I said, he's a Soviet actor. And he said, no, my dear, he's the Robert Redford of Russia. And I thought, oh my God, now what am I into? <laughs> and my father, who was in the film industry, I grew up in the film industry, always told me, no actors. So I called him and I said, well, what about a Soviet actor? And he says, what's the difference? <laughs> but anyway, they liked him when they, when they met him. Um, I don't know. It just sort of worked from the beginning. And um, uh, Oleg never did anything small. I've got people here in the audience who can tell you Oleg never did anything on a small scale. So um, my life changed because he saw everything big and everything he wanted to do. He said, well, you'll manage this. It started with airplane, with cargo airplanes. The, he wanted he wanted me to fly, help, go to the United Nations and bid for international humira, humanitarian flights for this cargo um, uh, plane company in Ukraine. And I said, I, I I know how to get on the plane and fly someplace. That's all I know. He said, No, you can do this. And we did for two years. Wow. We flew every day to Sarajevo. We flew every day to Mogadishu. We airlifted you know, food into Angola. It was really fun, but would you, could I, how did I know I could do that? <laughs> Just like with the animation. He said, you know, I, I decided that we're going to buy all this animation. I said, for what? You heard me. I said, who's going to buy it? But he was sure that, you know, that it was wonderful. And in fact, he took over the sales and sold it to like 52 countries. Um, and uh, as, you know, we said in the movie, he, it, it changed everything. Suddenly, people all over the world were watching this beautiful animation. Your film obviously touches on this. It, as positive as he tried to be, there were dark times for him as well, as you would expect for anyone who had to leave his homeland. Um, how, do you, how do you handle that in a relationship? How do you keep it from destroying a relationship or eroding a relationship? I, um, I, I think I said it in the movie, I was just very non-judgmental. I did whatever... I could to help him get through the hard times, and there were some hard times, um, but there were mostly good times. He was a Gemini, but he, but both, si both sides were good. 
I never knew which one it was when I woke up in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> but both of them were. <laughs> I think there's a Gemini up there. Gemini. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but um, in his case, there wasn't one evil and one good. They were both just nice people, just a little bit different from each other. Hmm. Talk to us about how the idea for the film went from just being an idea to being real. So as I said, Oleg never did anything small. So for the last three years, he had been writing his autobiography, and he left me a list of 60 people in eight countries to interview in order to finish the autobiography. Hmm. So, um, you know, I'm from the film industry. Everybody knows from the film industry. So we decided that nobody was getting younger or healthier and that we should film the interviews. And pretty soon it was clear in those eight countries um, that we had a film. Now we needed a director. Um, and so um, we had a friend who is a famous Australian film director named Nadia Toss, um, whose grandparents had fled the Bolshevik Revolution and gone to Greece and raised her culturally, speaking Russian, reciting Russian poetry, acting out Russian plays. And I thought, you know, that's perfect. She doesn't have to learn about Soviet Union, which it, especially then, but also now, it's a pretty hard learn. I mean, it's really hard to understand why they do what they do. But culturally, it was pretty impressive. So she became the director. Um, and then um, the crew that was assembled, um, the primary crew specifically, um, they all had one foot in Russia. They, they had been there. They knew about it. And again, there was no learning curve. So um, the writer, Corey Taylor, where's his wife here? I think she's in the other one, um, had filmed in the Soviet Union, made a documentary there. Lenny, the other, Leonard Feinstein, the other one, um, who is a cousin of um, uh, Trotsky, Leon Trotsky, mm. had filmed there. Um, everybody who was involved had kind of, if they weren't Russian, they had been there, they knew about it, and that made it really easy. And then when I was looking for a narrator, I was talking to this um, uh, agent who you know, does voices, and whoever I asked for, he said, no, Brian Cox. I said, why Brian Cox? He said, Brian Cox. <laughs> so then I understood, I found out, that Brian Cox taught acting in the Soviet Union for two years. And then he mm. wrote a book about it, and then the BBC produced a two-part documentary for him called Brian Cox's Russia. And in fact, he could, if you can tell, he pronounced everything perfectly, and he um, didn't have any trouble with some of the stuff that seemed really weird to the rest of us about the Soviet Union because he lived it. So that was really interesting. Hmm. And then um, for the voice of Oleg, I needed someone who was a native speaker of Russian um, but had really good English, and that was the first choice was Costa Ronan, and he immediately agreed. So that part was all very interesting. Um, one of the problems was that um, as we were finishing, there was a lot, the COVID lockdown started, and um, Baryshnikov was in his house, locked up in his house in, um, outside of New York City because he'd had a lung problem before. So he was terrified, and uh, he didn't want Nadia going there. He didn't want anybody coming there. But then it turned out his wife was a documentary director. So she interviewed him. Hmm. Um, and, that, uh, and then the last thing to do was um, we wanted to film the, refilm the beginning, recreate the beginning of the film, which is Oleg's escape across the border illegally into Austria. And so we had to wait for, um, because of COVID, they, the two countries had closed the border. We had to wait for the border to be reopened. And then there was no way Nadia could go there to direct it because she was in Australia, and if she left, they wouldn't let her back in. Um, and it turned out that modern technology is such that she could direct it from her home studio in Melbourne, Australia. Kind of amazing if you remember the beginning mm -hmm. of the movie. Mm -hmm. The only thing she couldn't do was control the drones. Wow. Were there moments of doubt during this project for you? Sure. <laughs> I mean, it took a lot of money to do. Um, so I was a little concerned about like losing my, uh, you know, money that I was going to need later in life. Um, and there were times when things didn't quite go right, but then suddenly they did. We were trying to figure out what to do about music. Nadia had one idea, somebody else had another. And then someone said, hey, um, Andrea Guerra, 
um, is a famous Italian composer, and his father was one of the great uh, Italian screenwriters, Tonino Guerra. And Tonino Guerra used to go once a year to the Soviet Union and work with the Soviet film industry. So another one who had one foot in the Soviet Union and one foot out. Um, and we, we love his score. Hmm. Do you feel that as the project was really coming together that Oleg was there with you? Yes. So I'm sorry, but for the first three years after he died, a bird flew into my window every day. <laughs> and somehow, I, I'm not superstitious, but I mean, really, the bird came every day. And, um, and sometimes I would be sitting there trying to think, okay, what do I do about this? What do I do about that? And the bird would come, and suddenly clarity would come. So, it, Alan, you know for years, is that something like me? No. <laughs> but that, that did happen. Okay. Let's open up to the audience. Uh, questions? Hi, Joan. It's Will Wallace. Hey. Hi. Um, I just want to say you did a great job with it, and it was a pleasure. I directed Oleg in a, the first picture I ever did, and, and I just, I was so moved. By, because I didn't, um, I knew part of his story, but I didn't know it to this extent. And he did a wonderful job. Oh, I'm so glad you're here. I remember that. And yeah, it's really, um, yeah. And I had such fond memories of Oleg. To, to, to do that for me on my first picture was um, such a kind heart. And he was so supportive. And um, it's just wonderful that you, you put this in stone now. So no, oh, thank you. Mike? Um, did you have any problem getting the footage from his early career from Russia? The truth is that Moss Film Studio literally opened the doors to me. Um, the head of Moss Film Studio managed to save the studio. None of the other studios really survived. Um, and he just said, you know, go to the archive, see what you can find there. Whatever clips you want, just give me a list. Um, you want to film part of the studio that looks like it did in the old days? Go ahead. And it was, it was great. Um, everybody was actually, I mean, he, he really is still loved there. And so everybody was really pretty cooperative. There were a few weird things that happened, but... Um, like? So the, he went to the Geek, the Soviet film school. And the rector, the new the rector at that time, at the time that I went to film, was somebody that we had worked for with during the animation. And I don't know what I did wrong. I don't know what Oleg did wrong. But um, he, refused, he refused to let me. Everybody let me go into their archives and find whatever I could. He refused to let us go into the archives. It was weird. And I kept saying, Mr. Malashev, I've been in your house. You've been in my house. What's going on yet? <laughs> hmm. Karen? Will you release a film in Russia? Will they just... Will they allow the documentary to be released there? They've been released. So I was, I was, you're talking about the, the documentary going to be shown in Russia? Exactly. Okay, so I negotiated with the first channel, the biggest one, until like November of, November before the invasion of Ukraine. And stuff started getting really weird. Like there's a scene where um, Putin meets with um, this oligarch who then comes and improbably buys us out and supposedly takes the, the, the animation back to Russia. It's actually all sitting in a vault in um, uh, Burbank. They never took it. But, uh, and I, I just began to feel that something was wrong. And then they, they said, well, we, we don't really like when the judge says their laws and their telephone calls and I got a telephone call. And I suddenly thought, you know what, nobody said anything like this two months ago. And something's changing. And I just said, I thought, you know what, if I sign these documents, even if it says they can't edit, they're going to edit. And I don't want to do that. Ola would not want that. Um, and then several months later, they invaded Ukraine. And in the meantime, everything and everything changed. And actually, where are you? My, <laughs> my co-producers ended up here in December um, 2020. They had to run away because Nikolai had gone and protested peacefully um, and they wanted to arrest him and put him in prison for the rest of his life. So they got on, on a plane and came here, and it was all like, it was sort of like they were setting up everything so that people would know they couldn't say anything negative about the government. That's my opinion. And that's why we ended, I mean, he was protesting the decision to raise the pension age. I mean, how, 
how terrible is that? But they were trying to make a point that to the, to the little, little guys, not to the big guys, you know, don't say a word against the government. In the back. Aside from the lawsuit that was filed against you, once you arrived with Oleg in the United States, um, were you pretty much left alone, or was it still kind of touch and go as far as all the security in there? So the short version is we went to Brighton Beach to try to find copies of his movies, and we were followed. Um, even if we went into a restaurant, and there was nobody else in the restaurant, and the same guy showed up. And then that night, we went to dinner with our friends. He's the, he was the vice president of NBC to this very posh restaurant near our hotel in Manhattan. And, when, uh, and his, wife was the, the, he, his wife was NBC at the United Nations. So we said we would walk back to our hotel. They went to get in their car, and they saw a car with UN, li UN license plates in front of them. And Beverly said to her husband, those are, Russian, those are Soviet plates. Yeah. So they waited for this guy to like, show up, and when she, she yelled, hey, Oleg, oh, Oleg, <laughs> and he ran away. Um, and then um, I got a call uh, from someone who said they were from San Francisco, and they said when Oleg was there doing PR, uh, he left some papers. What was the address? And we'll send them back. So I stupidly gave them the address. <laughs> and Oleg said, I've never been in San Francisco. Uh, and there, a letter came from the Soviet consulate that said, you better go back before it's too late. So I called the FBI. And for the next three years, every time somebody from the Soviet embassy came to Los Angeles, they called me and said, you know, lock him in the house. You know what, he, he decided to go back to the Soviet Union at the end of 1991 because everything had changed. But he refused to get a, he refused, all the other Russians were getting Russian passports. He refused because he felt if anything happened to him, he wanted the Americans to come and get him. My closing question would be, when you look at this and you see it on screen, what, is, what does this ultimately mean for you and to you? Um, I just think that he had um, a very interesting and important life, and I'm really glad that, you know, to the best of my ability, I was able to capture part of it um, so that other people could understand who he was and um, maybe understand something about the Soviet Union. And if I can say one more thing, the, um, I, I went to a festival in London, which we won, um, <clears throat> and it was three days after the invasion of Ukraine. And uh, the audience like, was different. And um, suddenly it went from being a biopic to like a timely movie. And um, I think Vladimir Putin has been my best publicist because <laughs> now everybody wants to see the movie. Um, so I guess you know, he would be okay with that, although he wouldn't be okay with Vladimir Putin being his publicist, not in the way he's being the publicist. But for you personally? It's a big achievement. You know, I, as, as my husband's um, assistant, I um, got the damned animation <laughs> done and all over the world. But um, this, I sort of did this on my own with the bird and <laughs> with a lot of, <laughs> with a lot of um, help from some wonderful people. Well, best of luck through award season. We hope the rest of your qualifying run goes well. And thank you for bringing this film to us. Thank you. Joan Borston-Greedock.